whether you're a day camp, resident camp, nonprofit, for profit, municipal, religious, whatever. These last two summers have shaken the camp industry and exposed areas that need our immediate attention. You can hide your head in the sand and wait for the good old days to return, or you can evolve and thrive. This Go Camp Pro crossover pod sets the stage for some of the big decisions we need to be making as camp professionals this off season. So take a deep breath and open your mind because here we go. Welcome everybody to a special crossover episode of the Camp Owners Podcast and the Day Camp Pod. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And I am Kelly Shuna, owner, and I just changed my title, Executive Director of Hidden Pines baby. Ranch Day Camp. Oh, baby. Whoa, breaking news. <laughs> I, I am know. Howie you Grossinger. heard it here first. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> and I'm Howie Grossinger, and I am the owner of Camp Robin Hood, a day camp in the suburbs of Toronto. Uh, you know, Kelly, I just listened to your guys, uh, the, the husband and wife podcast that you just did. Was this as a result of the husband and wife podcast? Is this deferred respect now happening here? Uh, <laughs> no, this is reflective of our second topic we're going to talk about today of the need to reorganize. Uh, and so I needed to step away from the day to day. So we'll get into more of that later. But oh, nope, I, P and I are still partners in all ways, but um, new title. Why is, why is the podcast partner the last to know about this news? <laughs> I don't know, Howie. I don't know. We need more ketchup, we'll apparently. We'll Trying to get millions of people hearing at the same time, Howie. So, so what Kelly was just alluding to is that we're going to try to cover uh, two topics, two really big topics, and and um, we're, we're not going to be able to get too heavily into them. We're, we'll branch off and go into our own podcasts uh, afterwards. Um, so, so the big thing here um, to to take an idea that Howie was throwing out there is um, rethinking camp, coming from Adam Grant. Uh, book that he recently put out and some stuff on that. Um, this is an opportunity now for us to pivot and to rethink how things are going. We all had really rough, rough summers. And just hearkening back to, you know, 14 years ago when the recession hit, at least in the United States, I don't know how it would happen to Canada. I'm assuming it was there. But, um, you know, a lot of a lot of camp operators in um, in America were sort of just like, well, we're just going to ride this baby out and hopefully it goes back to normal. That was like their attitude. And I think that was pretty short-sighted because sometimes when these sort of seismic things take place, things don't go back to normal. They change forever. And um, the issues that we had with our staff last summer, um, those are big things. Not to mention that at least in the United States, again, uh, we're going up to $15 minimum wage all over. And whether you're exempt or not, if they're paying the guy at Burger King $15 an hour, you're going to have to pay them. Uh, you're going to have to find a way. So um, so that leads me into the first topic that we're going to throw out to the, the peanut gallery that we have assembled here today, which is if we, it, well, not if, as we are going to have to pay our staff more. And we are going to have to, we, we can only raise our tuition so much, um, you know, whether it's 3%, 5%, 7%, whatever you're doing. Um, I know that just speaking for my camp, I think I'm charging as much as I could possibly charge. I don't think I could charge anymore. And, um, but I got to pay people more. So my profit margin is going down. And for people like Sam and the not-for-profit camps that are trying to hit like a break-even point with their budgets every single year, it's even a bigger problem because they have less money in their booty. I'm probably charging three or four times what Sam charges for enrollment. Um, so where do we start? Where do we start looking? How do we start rethinking our program, our facilities, our customer service, maybe even, right? Um, and, 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 you know, how he had mentioned before we started that, you know, a lot of people, they sort of stuck with us this last two years, and now they're hoping everything's going to be back to normal um, coming next year. And I, you know, I challenge that, that this, you know, we could blame COVID for a lot. And we can blame COVID for rethinking and repivoting. And, and part of that being going back to like what's more important and potentially taking out the bells and whistles. So I think I've already talked too much for four, four podcasters. So I'm, I'm handing it off to the next person who would like to step in. <laughs> well, I think, I think for me, Andy, this is, an, this is a really awesome topic because rethinking was used as a sort of catch-all phrase as we thought about how do we deliver camp during COVID, of course, with all the public health regulations, et cetera. 
And now the theme of rethinking continues to be an important thing thing for all of us. We, we definitely have gone through an, uh, um, an exercise here at camp, our camp, of finding the silver linings, you know, this idea of the things that we did without that we can still continue to do. And maybe no one knows any better because they had never been to us. Andy, you alluded to the fact that you have a sizable number of new clients. They didn't know the way it was before. And we have a very similar uh, experience as well, uh, but also the things we know we need to bring back because they just return to some of the tradition we like. So the exercise of doing all that is part, a big part of this time of year for us. Um, and I know that Kelly hasn't launched registration yet. Uh, Sam, I'm not sure where you are in getting all that rolling. You know, our camp is similar to Andy's. You know, we, we've been six weeks into registration. So we have a really good sense of who's coming back and what the, the makeup of that population is. So I think I'm challenging my team to start thinking about what's happening. We have a towel service for swim, you know, at day camp. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't do it in 2021, and we're now going through the T-chart of what are the things that the parents want. I did raise fees. You know, maybe towel service has to come back, but that aspect of the special program doesn't because we can now do some other sort of back-to-basic stuff or continue that trend. So that's the exercise that we're going through currently, and it's uh, it's 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 so worthwhile and. I think as long as you're communicating to your families and letting them know, I think being transparent about all these things, you put yourself in a good position for them to buy in. We spent two years being transparent with our parents. We're yeah. not going to stop being transparent. And they know that everything costs more, right? Everything, the supply chain thing is not a joke. That is not a catchphrase. That's reality. Okay, I'm trying to build things, capital improvements going on right now. And I can't get a contractor. I can't get an engineer to draw plans for a contractor I can't find. Yeah. Right. It's just ridiculous what's going on. And that parents understand that because they're dealing with that at their own homes, right, in their own businesses. And, you know, one thing, Howie, you know, just to give Kelly a look into the future, Howie and ours are, are early enrollment are off the charts, like best that they've ever been. Right. So people, people want camp. Silver lining, the huge silver lining of camping the last two years is that it got all these people who never thought about camp to go, wow, what a great proposition. This being outside with no electronics thing, you know, really is, right? So I think this is a huge opportunity for us. So will the two of you who have started registration clarify for me quickly before Sam, um, I know you have something to say. Did Were you transparent in your pre-registration communication, Howie, did you say, hey, this is back or this isn't? Or, you know, like Andy said, we brought back this whistle or now is it a cowbell? Like, did you specifically say what it will look like? Or you just said, sign up for 2022. It's going to be great. We, we have not, we have not provided any details of what's coming back. Um, and we've sort of slow released information as people came back, but parents aren't even asking about what, you know, is the music coming program coming back that you ran in 2019 or like they're not even doing that they just want their spot and they want their kids in a place that is far away from their screens and whatever school looked like this year that's all they really care about so we we haven't even begun to think about uh, communicating those pieces to families yet um, but just about you know you all you all recognize the value of coming to camp now it's time to get on and get on this early and they have yeah, it's don't get shut out. That's the message right now. And you know, ditto for everything Howie said. And I just want to harken back to a day camp podcast from last year with Liz and Andy Kimmelman is their husband. They run Camp Tumbleweed out in uh, California, some of our new wake friends. And, you know, after the last summer, after 2020, she got so inspired by like what is important in camp that she literally went to her website and took out every single thing that's not just about relationships and social skills and that kind of thing and took it off because she didn't want any expectations of anything besides kids playing with each other. <laughs> that's it. So um, I find that very inspirational personally. I'm just now getting my registration ready to go and just finished my budgets. And one nice thing in my situation is that I had not um, raised prices in over four years. So I was able to raise a little to do the raises for the staff. Um, but being a nonprofit and being so um, 
economical for parents as I have been, I've always had to do, you know, reuse, recycle, cheap arts and crafts, that kind of thing. But two things I learned in the last two years that I'm keeping is one, I don't have to cater to parents anymore. Um, their schedules, I used to do, you know, punch pass, which was one day anytime you wanted it, or three days or whatever. And when I got rid of that, um, in the last two years, parents still came and then I'm getting a five day a week person, where I feel they're getting more of what they should get out of camp than a one or three day. Um, the other thing was I started using more of our facilities because um, we're a government agency. We have different facilities in our local town. I started using more of those and going to more different parks instead of doing the flashy trips. Um, I still have a few flashy trips, some highlights, but, um, but not doing it every week, um, I think was better for the staff, more relaxing for the staff and for the kids. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah. you know, go, 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 go. Yeah. I, I have not read this Adam Grant book, but I'm guessing that part of it is you got that you, we need to be bold and we need to have some courage at this point. And I think that as camp owners, camp operators, I think we get paranoid in, in underestimating our parents and thinking that they're just worried about you know, whatever. And, and, and I think that I feel strongly that the pandemic has beaten them down enough to that to point that they can really just appreciate the essence of camp. And, and they're so appreciative and grateful for us forging forward and taking on all the added costs that were all the added headaches and, and, and the, what we're going to have to start paying staff now, because you see it, you see what they're paying, you know, FedEx and UPS and all these things, you know, 18 to $21 an hour, $5,000 signing bonus, make your own hours. Okay. That's our seasonal staff now that we have to start thinking about. So, you know, I, I would just like to also add, I mean, we happen to be the four of us uh, predominantly day camp folks, but I, you know, um, but I also own an overnight camp and um, just the, the demands for overnight camp space has never been like this for us. So, you know, we have a waiting list. We've had to build two new That's cabins awesome. for our youngest campers. And I think there's what we're recognizing also is that parents are considering sending their kids a year younger to overnight camp in some sense. And I don't know from a day camp phenomena, but we're recognizing both the day camp and the overnight is that some of these families are now talking about and have registered typically a year younger. I want them to go a year younger with their sibling to camp where I wouldn't have sent the older sibling uh, at that age, but I'm now sending my youngest. And I think it's, it's multifactorial why they, why they feel that way. But I do generally think that camp is um, a real trusting environment. I think us as camp pros over this year and a half have done such a wonderful job of communicating openly about what we do, how we do it, the care and concern we have. I think all of the efforts we've made to communicate, not only living up to public health measures, but attending to the mental health needs of all of our campers and our staff have put us in a place of trust that we've never seen before. And I think in large part, that has resulted in the numbers we're seeing both at day and overnight camp, because I think that with the demands on teachers over the course of 10 months in large classrooms and, and all the things that are going on north and south of the border, I think they see this, you know, what we do as a place where they can just really breathe easy. And uh, I mean, we could have another conversation that when they're demanding and when they're on you, they're about as tough as they can be in some cases, but nonetheless, I it's just a vocal minority. Piece. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. That's the vocal minority. That's how mm -hmm. I see it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I would agree. That's a great way to describe them, Andy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for us, we, you know, I know I have to, I know I'm going to raise prices just like every other industry. I'm going to raise my prices. Also help me on the wake call to hear how much California families are paying per day for camp. Holy Mama California, wowza. Yeah, that's um, Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Holy, and San, holy Los Angeles cow. and San Francisco are crazy. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and that again, we could, everybody's talking about raising prices or not. How do you deal with that? I think for me personally, what I'm really rethinking um, per Adam Grant and just the staff focus, I'm right now hyper focused on the staff piece 
Um, because then I think for me, that will determine really what we do overnights, right? Because if I'm paying staff an overnight, you know, to work 24 hours to do our tent overnights that we typically do this year, we did late nights, but I will have to then look at that programming cost of 19 versus 21 and what can we afford to bring back and what can we not. But I'm really rethinking the flexibility too. Like, I don't really think that we're, we're not just talking with staff about wages. I think we're really going to have to give a little, and this is hard, but a little more rethinking about flexibility in staff want to be able to go to a doctor's appointment. They want flexibility. They want some time off. And we have been very much like, nope, this is a short season. You're working for eight and a half, nine weeks. But what I'm really doing some rethinking on is, am I going to hire a rover position that's going to allow, you know, some, there will be a process, but to be able to have some flexibility and we're all about relationships at our camp hundred percent. But I also think we need to do a little bit of rethinking on, can we be any more of a flexible employer? Cause we ask them a lot of them and it's go, go, go. So is there, is there room for that? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, I think that's a unanimous thing we're hearing across the North America. Um, my bigger worry is folks like Sam, you know, with these not-for-profit camps that aren't, aren't charging that much, you know, when you look at a budget, you know, and, and keeping gas in the tank, right. As Jonathan Gold would say, um, you know, staff has always been, you know, the biggest part of our budget. And now if you add 20% to that, you know, 30% to that, right. I mean, what we spend on our program is minuscule compared to that. And you really hate chipping away at it. Um, but you know, like we're not doing rocketry and things like that. Like we, we have to like, just look at those high ticket items and not do it. That's what I think. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. I, I do agree with you, Andy. I think that, you know, I, I think about Sam as well. I think about some of the organizations up here, um, and, uh, especially, and, and now that we have a huge segment up here in, in our neck of the woods of camps that, are now coming back with two years of not operating in some cases. And, and the challenges that they're facing about keeping their 2000, you know, what, what chances will they have of keeping 2019 staff interested in re returning two years after the fact? And now what they've done with pricing and how much can they in fact raise? So I know that those conversations are happening up here and, um, you know, quite, significantly it's it's not about how did you manage COVID it's how are we uh for the for the camps that have been away for two years it's like how do we get my people back so I'm not starting from scratch with my staff that's a that's a big topic up here yeah and just just touching on this on the resident camp thing for a second Howie um <laughs> my son <laughs> who was 21 he worked seven weeks at Steve Baskin's camp champions and then he worked seven weeks at my camp he worked 14 weeks last summer <laughs> But um, talk about the crossover kid, but um, he was like, you, you know, he experienced real tough staff situations there at that resident camp. Um, and one of the things he was saying, he was like, you know, they're paying me half of what I would make at day camp and I'm working three times as much, you know, it's a weird proposition. Like, how are you going to get people off the street and pay them between a thousand and two thousand dollars, let's say you know, for eight weeks of work. That is a rough proposition that, you know, I'm wondering what you guys are thinking at your sleepaway camp, Howie, because obviously getting the kids, no problem. <laughs> getting the staff, yeah. challenging. Well, I think like a lot of resident camps, you know, we're, we're going to lean a little much more on our, on our uh, foreign staff as much as we can. Uh, we did a double cohort of our CITs because they missed their CIT years. So we are starting off in a place at overnight camp where we have a larger pool of first year staff, which is really good for us. And many of them uh, want that first year staff experience. But yeah, I think we're in that same place with, you know, thinking about uh, where salaries need to go at overnight camp. And uh, I think we're all thinking about it because you're right, that difference between what we pay at day camp and being in the city or being, you know, living at home and, and all the expenses there and then being up at overnight camp, you know, that gap may have to close over the next several years uh, to make it more attractive. So maybe we don't rely on foreign staff as much as some of the overnight camps have
tended to do, um, you know, very successfully, but trying to find a healthy balance between homegrown and foreign is always a challenge. Andy said something earlier about going back to the basics about recruiting. Um, now we're doing it not for, for kids, but for staff members. So um, I'm going to do care packages at Christmas time for the staff that are coming back with shirts that say, um, if you want to have a job that makes a difference, ask me and throw them back into college and hopefully we'll get some, you know, more bites from people that way. But, you know, going back to the basics of and and re-messaging what it is to work here to try to get them to come in. Yeah. Well, I think the COVID silver lining of enrollment being so, you know, strong for most camps is that we will be able to focus more on staffing, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You know, which is what a lot of sleepaway camps were doing back when I got into this business in the 90s. They were had that luxury of that. So yep. now we can hopefully do that. All right. So before we go to part two of our little uh, segment here, um, I just want to give a shout out to our common sponsor, Camptivities, baby. All right. So, you know, talk about, you know, where you can spend a lot of bandwidth and a lot of hours, you know, sitting there with your Excel spreadsheets and your, or, or if you're, God forbid, using pencil and paper and all that kind of thing. Um, I actually have a meeting with them this afternoon to talk about potentially using them this summer um, because I need to streamline things. Um, you know, things are getting more complex. And, um, you know, one of the things I was talking about, uh, the Camp Activities folks was, is that similar to using, whether it's Camp Rain or Camp Minder or one of these other uh, companies that has many get camps, right, is that when you, when you sign on with them, you sort of get their best practices from other camps, because mm -hmm. there's, you know, th they work with them. So uh, while they're going to um, potentially change the way that I do things, maybe it'll be a change for the better. Well, I find, you know, Andy, we're, we've been a Camptivities user at our day camp for many years now, and we have definitely uh, benefited from the, the growth of the platform from the input of many day camps. And we'd like to think that, you know, our unique approach to uh, day camp scheduling has enhanced it for other people too. So uh, it's been really nice to move away from Excel. It's been really nice to give uh, a couple of my staff, one in particular, uh, the responsibility of connecting with Ryan and the team, uh, you know, figuring out the, the time difference from Toronto to LA and all that good stuff. But nonetheless, the fact is, is that Camptivities has really helped us move forward. And we're really grateful that they support both shows the way that they do. Yeah. I'm all, all about right. the streamline. I'm all about the streamline, especially after the summer. Anything that can be taken off our plate, see ya. Yes. I'll take it. So right. I'll be well, excited keep, to hear what you think, Andy. Keep your mic on, Kelly, because I'm going to have you frame this next section because you were the, the head cheerleader for this. Um, so, so take it away. Take it away. Well, the next topic that we wanted to start as a springboard for further conversations was how we and I have been talking a lot about reorg, the need to reorg and organize our leadership teams. And for me, um, you know, that conversation just started after the summer of having so, feeling so in the weeds with the day-to-day -day and needing to be able to share that. And Andy had mentioned what we're asking of our leadership team. I, our leadership team at our camp, we nailed it. We crushed it this year, but because we were such a tight-knit group that has worked together for so long, um, but we can't do it again. <laughs> so we did it, we survived, but I really reflected on this summer thinking, okay, I need to step into more really of a director and not so much in the day-to-day. -day. And what does that look like then capitalizing on what my, the tier under me, their strengths are and what they are great at and using their talents and gifts, but then what can they oversee? So we're looking at personally adding a whole another tier of leadership under my three other who are now directors, um, which will then, I hope, also be a spring point for our long-term counselors, those four-year counselors that want to come back, but they're not, they don't really want to have their own group again. So that's something we haven't done a great job of at my camp. So that's kind of where I'm coming from and wanting to explore reorging and how you do that. That's for great. For mine, I always, I, have an inclusion counselor with a normal counselor. Um, and I, I have four different locations. So I have a director and assistant director at each location where the assistant director's focus was more on 
counselor support. But in some cases last summer, we had um, our inclusion children needed so much support that the assistant director ended up um, being with those counselors the entire time and not getting anything else done. So I'm looking to find a way to get um, more subs, to get breaks for the counselors and um, somebody who can step in and not have it always be just the assistant director there to help support the staff that are going through, um, you know, the runners and the ones that eat and then throw up and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I, I am, uh, I am of the belief that uh, the, that camps in general have been set up in a way that has really put a lot upon everybody. And that's just the way it's been. And, you know, you can say that we've been lucky, you know, um, they've been able to power through every summer. Um, you know, we found these like marathon runners, right? These decathletes. So, um, but this summer it was different and there was pushback and, and, and I'm sure it's going to get better. I'm sure that I, I feel strongly that last summer was like an apex of whatever you want to call it. Um, but I think that what it did is that it exposed our wrinkles and our warts and it, and it, and it, it made it, it took the tough situations and made them tougher. Right. And it sort of like shone a light on it and said, you need to fix this. <laughs> right. And we'd be negligent by not paying it attention. And just going back to the first thing that Kelly was saying, you know, you're saying like being more of a director, I say you're being more of an executive director, right. You're being more of a, of an owner. Right. So, you know, in private world, we would say an owner, in Sam's world, it would be an executive director um, because there are just so many big picture things that you need to deal with. And if you're in the weeds, you can't. It just takes up too many of your bandwidth, too much of your bandwidth. And you know, there's only so many direct reports that a person can handle. Um, and and you therefore, you know, it's like an unintended consequence of success. If you have a successful organization, you need to institute these things and, and you can't run like you're a little tiny thing anymore and stuff like Sam was just mentioning with the the special needs kids like once we started getting successful in the special needs area we just had to be like that's not my wheelhouse like we need to bring in special ed teachers that are, this is what they do and these folks do intakes for us throughout the year they work part-time throughout the year and then three people work full-time in the summer just overseeing the special needs kids because it's such a huge thing I know they do that at Howie's camp too mm -hmm. um so at, at my camp with the biggest struggles that we've had, well, first of all, let me just say my middle management people, my division leaders, my unit leaders, right? They're doing an impossible job. There's no way for them to do it hundred percent. Like it's just an impossible job. It's like, it's almost like they're mini camp directors. So the, and what was the toughest part of their job? Well, it used to be the parents, right? <laughs> Not anymore. Now it's a staff. And um, you know what Kelly was saying about those three people she's talking about. I'm definitely talking about putting two people, at least maybe three, in the same exact way, Kelly. And, and one of those people's main responsibilities is gonna be the staff. They're gonna be like a, a walk-in HR department in a way. And it's sort of, uh, Howie, very much like a sleepaway camp concept where you have like the boys head counselor and the girls head counselor. Like what do those head counselors do, right? They're go-betweens for the directors and they're helping support the, the division leader kind of people when they have staff issues, right? And at a day camp where we have so many camper issues and, and, and they're dealing with the parents and this kid's getting in fights and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Let our middle management people deal with that. And let's have a, a different realm of people that are supporting these crazy staff things that are inevitably gonna be coming up. Because last summer at my camp, they went to either myself or my social worker. And my social worker is supposed to be taking care of the kids. <laughs> You know, and we had two social workers. So that's why I think I need another level and that I'm going to be putting in. Yeah, and I, I've had a, a similar awakening moment uh, last year, you know, returning to operating in 2021. I, I, in some ways, I've reflected on one of the, the, the missteps that I made was I used the phrase, uh, we're going to do more with less. And I didn't mean it in that, like the, the, the term that ultimately people sort of, you know, said, well, how we said we're doing more with less. So I think we need to roll with it. And, and I, and I recognize midway through the summer that they didn't, they didn't, I didn't clarify that as well as I could have. And, and I, and I do recognize that uh, organizationally, while we do have a wonderful layer of assistant directors and, 
you know, happy to say, Andy, I don't, you know, we, we, my daughter Jordana has joined us full time now. So that's been super exciting. And she works with a great group of experienced teachers that do this in the summer as well. But we did recognize that, you know, carefully assessing the ratio of campers and staff to a particular manager, let's call them, or to a division head or a unit head is a, needs to be an intentional exercise where you can say, knowing what I know about the demands of our parents, what kids are coming to camp with, and now what staff are coming to camp with, we need to exercise a system that can give us hopefully the best results possible where we can show equal parts support for campers, parents, and staff. So we are adding a layer of division director, which we're happy to do. But in large part, as it is with many of us, is if I don't start giving our young teachers, our 23 to 26-year-olds who've been with me since they were campers and young leaders, uh, a vision for a future at camp summer after summer with more responsibility and, and more meat on the bone, I don't wanna lose these great folks. So we have done sort of a relook of how can we incorporate them into the larger leadership team, give them their own piece of the pie that they can see as, and quite frankly, it will be more responsibility. And, um, and obviously we need to look at the budget for staffing those positions and all those things, but the awakening for us is how do we manage the, the the appropriate amount of staff, the appropriate number of campers, because some of my top people, as you were saying, you know, Sam, with, you know, people who help your your staff who work with special needs is my assistant directors were now getting in the weeds of making sure Johnny ate his lunch properly. And what did he get his sunscreen on or did Jamie you know, did we help relocate the towel? Like we need to rethink, like those people can't be used in those ways. We've got to find better layers of stuff. I mean, it could be argued, I got to train my counselors better to not have that happen. But aside from that, from a supervision point of view, um, we needed to really take a closer look. And I had created a model that I got buy-in from our leadership team and we're starting to make that happen. And there's a lot of excitement about that, but but we're, I, I love the fact that we're, and, but we're so good at thinking of these things, maybe sometimes two years too late, but we are willing to do these things, which I appreciate. And it sounds like we're all navigating similar challenges. I like, Howie, that you have program progression for your staff, because you're right, when you've had the same staff for many years, um, you have to have someone <laughs> die or retire to be able to move up. And so to have another layer that um, they can learn more and do more um, along the way, that's a great idea. So. Mm -hmm. We had the same thing, Howie, where our now called directors, but my leadership team was stepping in for six counselors, sick counselors and being subs. And like, we should not be doing that. We need another layer of staff. Like you said, that tiered approach and what are you really overseeing? And we tote so much that relationship and we know that we're a great place for staff, but when they're so in the weeds of those things, they can't mentor. And that's what we're there for. And the feedback I continue to get um, is always, we want to, they want to hear from me. <laughs> they want to see me, which I want to be seen too, but they want to hear from me and they want to see me out and about. So it's an awakening for me. Like, I like that word awakening because that's what it's been is what is my time worth? So what should I be doing with my time and what is how can I streamline then those other duties to be done and that tiered approach of, you know, let's stay in our where we're successful lanes or what we really should be taking on and not taking on. Yeah, and I think that one of the sort of Achilles heels of <clears throat> us, of uh, people or camp operators is we like doing the stuff that we like doing <clears throat> and we don't wanna relinquish it. And then at some point we grow up and put our big girl pants on like you, Kelly, and say, I'm going to be an executive director and I'm just going to do this stuff that's important, right? And that's a, that's a huge step. It really is. I mean, Sam works for an organization that's very, you know, plenty of red tape bureaucracy because it's it's a, you know, it's a it's municipality basically, right? Um, but most private camps, we don't get that 
you know, we, we screw up all the time. Like, you know, the great story I always tell is one of my friends, you know, guy was camp director in his sixties. And like, you know, it would be like, I'd go visit him in like April or May where everything's like super intense. And he's literally mowing his lawn of the camp. He's not on the ride on more. And I'm like, why are you doing this? And he says, it's because I like, this is what I like to do, you know? And then there I am spending an hour and a half making a flyer, right? Because I like doing that. You know, it's the same stupidity right, that, that we fall into. <clears throat> so, and then the thing that you touched on, which is really important, Kelly, um, about people want to come to you. Yeah, you're super freaking friendly and you have an awesome personality. And if I worked for you, I would be pissed if you told me you're going to become the executive director now and you're going to report to Joe Schmo. Like I would, because wait a second, Kelly hired me 10 years ago. You know, one of my friends, <laughs> similar situation, he runs an appliance repair shop right? And he's very successful at it. And he has three people working for him. And he has these clients that are like, no, no, I want you, Tony, to come fix my refrigerator, right? And I'm like, Tony, you have to, either you charge them double, or you tell them that you can't. But like, you, you got to start, you just got to do what's best for the business. At some point, it's hard. Because, you know, again, the biggest Achilles heel for all of us is that we're super nice people. And we fall into the super nice people traps like that right and you know that's why one of the reasons i love your podcast the day the, the camp owners podcast is because you try really hard to you you're sort of you know you're skating on that that line of well we're business people but we're also really we're camp people or, you know <laughs> that kind of thing too um and it's tough it's like a dichotomy that we constantly have to be battling and balancing sometimes it, it andy also, it, i think yeah. mowing is our self-care sure you know whatever your mowing is is kind of your self-care yeah Right. Yeah. All of a sudden, it actually sounds really smart now. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's a really good point. And I think that that relinquishing that you talked about, Andy, you know, has to be kind of strategic too, because what is the, you know, what is the proposition for parents and staff to come on board with us? And some of it is access to you or Kelly or Sari and myself in our settings per se. And you got to be very careful on how you relinquish that or communicate that now that, you know, and I'm going through this too now. It's like, and we went this through generationally as a family business. It went from Sari's dad, who at some point had to say, that sounds like a really important issue, Mrs. Smith, but my daughter, Sari, is now the one who's going to be dealing with that. And now we're at a phase in our lives where our daughter or our key team who've been with us for 15, so you just have to find you know, really good and it plays to your personality too, because they're on board for some reason. I think it's very doable, but you know, some people who are used to only talking to me may not take very lightly for me to say, you know, I want you to talk to so-and-so. So I think that those are some, you've got to give some forward thinking to how you're going to navigate and communicate those things moving forward, both internally and externally. Because even within your operation, you know, some people are just used to coming to me when it's time to you know, okay, who's going to do the run to, you know, the shop to get this fixed? And I say, you know what, Jeff takes care of that now. You go, but I always come to you. No, Jeff's doing it now. So you just, I just think it opens up a, a very strategic lens that you have to look at this through um, for these very reasons. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's something we struggle with. You know, this is, it's a business and it's a love and it's a passion and it's all these kind of things, but we have to, we have to start treating it the same way. So plenty here to nosh on. And plenty more that we will be we will be transferring over to our to our podcasts in the future. So uh, I don't know if anybody has any last things to say, or we'll just wrap this baby up. But this has been a pleasure. Um, like I said, I, I I love listening to you guys. Um, you guys have been on the Day Camp Pod, and uh, and have always been very super engaging and stuff. And um, and yeah, we have challenges ahead of us. But um, I think you know, as they say, the easiest thing to do is nothing right right it's easy to just sort of fall back and just yeah we'll tweak it a little bit kind of thing right it, the hardest thing is to take bold steps and i think that the opportunity is like a red carpet laid out to us right now and uh and now's the time people are going to understand <laughs> why we're doing these things <laughs> so uh i want to thank the go camp pro team camptivities am skyer camp brain all our, all our fine sponsors for uh, allowing us to bring this podcast to you. And if you like what you hear, you should subscribe to the Camp Owners Pod and the Day Camp Pod on your favorite podcast platforms. So check out the show notes from this and other episodes, plus contact information for this show and uh, for my co-hosts here, Kelly, Howie, Sam. 
Um, so thanks for listening and make yourself a better camp professional. We'll be back soon with new episodes of the Day Camp Pod and the Day Camp, uh, excuse me, the Camp Owners Podcast very, very soon. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Good luck. Be brave.